Today's sermon is entitled, Saint Joseph and Chastity. Sacred scripture tells us that Saint Joseph was a just man. That's all it says. This terse but meaningful phrase means that Saint Joseph had all of the virtues and did not sin against God. Now, only our Blessed Lady was exempt from all venial sin. <clears throat> we, apart from a special grace, cannot avoid venial sin <clears throat> without, a, without a special grace. <coughs> only Our Lady had that. So even great saints commit venial sins every day. These are known as sins of weakness. <clears throat> Uh, that is, we have not sufficiently mortified our tendencies to sin, and these come out usually in little movements of anger or impatience and so forth. <clears throat> but Our Lady had none of that. So St. Joseph did commit some venial sins. If we meditate on this statement a little bit <clears throat> and consider with it the degree of purity which God required in the Blessed Virgin Mary, in order that she be his holy dwelling place on earth, <clears throat> we can construct a picture of the virtues of this silent but great man, St. Joseph. Because he had all the virtues, we know that in order to be the foster father of Christ, the true spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the protector of them both, he must have had these virtues to an eminent degree, whether it be justice or charity, meekness or mildness, prudence or fortitude, obedience or humility, we know that they were all there and to a high and noble degree. <clears throat> For our Blessed Lady received the privilege of her Immaculate Conception for the sole reason of her designation to be the Mother of God and this because sin is utterly detestable in God's sight. And he could not dwell in a womb that had ever known sin, that had ever been the dwelling place of Satan through sin, even original sin. <clears throat> in similar fashion, it was fitting that his home in Nazareth, which was a type of extension of the sacred and sinless womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the palace of God. That this home of Nazareth be also sinless, pure, and undefiled. In order that this be so, St. Joseph had to be sinless, pure, and undefiled. There is no evidence in Revelation <clears throat> that St. Joseph was immaculately conceived. And we therefore can as cannot assign this privilege to him. But from the statement that he was a just man and from the events in the gospel in which he appears, we may rightfully conclude that he was a man of the highest virtue, a gem among men. But just like all saints, there were certain virtues in St. Joseph which stood out more than others. And one of these was the virtue of chastity. We know that St. Joseph was committed to perfect chastity, even in the married state, from the statement made by Our Lady to the angel Gabriel. You should understand this about the Jewish customs. It was the custom for them first to contract a legal marriage. But they would not come together until weeks later. Now we see this in the parable of the foolish virgins because they were awaiting the spouse to come. That is when the spouse goes and takes his wife from her abode and brings her to his house. And so some of the virgins fell asleep and their lamps went out. Other virgins did not fall asleep and they went in with the spouse. That was the parable. And so that, that was indicative of the Jewish custom. <clears throat> so this is our, the angel Gabriel 
appears to Our Lady at this time when she is truly the wife of Joseph, but they had not yet come together. So they were truly married. Although she was married to St. Joseph, she was fearful of the angel's request that she should bear a child. For she thought that it would compromise her vow of virginity. So the first question is, how is this possible? For I know not man. Now this expression refers not only to the present moment, but it refers to a resolve that pertains to the future. I'll give you an example. If somebody offered you an alcoholic drink and you never had the habit of doing that, you would say, I don't drink. This was the same idea. This is something I don't do. So somehow, in order to obtain my consent, there can be no intervention of, the, the, of sexual pleasure in this case. <clears throat> From this, we conclude that St. Joseph had a similar resolve for, e for the uh, even for the married state, since otherwise Our Lady could never have made such a vow. They would have had to agree to this before they were married. So it was a virginal marriage from the beginning, before even the Annunciation. We therefore understand that even before the events of the Annunciation, St. Joseph was a man of marvelous chastity. Let us turn our attention to this beautiful virtue for a moment. I say that it is beautiful, for it is the ultimate way, apart from martyrdom itself, in which a soul gives itself to God. A flower is indeed beautiful. Its color and its perfume is meant to attract the insect who will bring to it the pollen from another flower. When this happens, the flower will die and become fruit. This indeed is a wonderful process, and the flower is put to good use. But a far more beautiful use of the flower is that it be cut with the effect that it will no longer bear fruit, and that it be placed on the altar of God or before a statue of our Blessed Lady, there to give glory to God by its color and by its perfumes. So it is a beautiful thing to see a bride come down the aisle in a splendid dress ready for her spouse. And it is a beautiful thing that they bear fruit in marriage and produce children for Almighty God. But it is a far more beautiful thing that a young lady should come down the aisle in the habit of a nun, ready to consecrate herself to a life of virginity. Here she is cutting herself off from the world and placing herself like a flower on the altar of God and before our Blessed Lady. Because her flower of virginity is spiritual and not material, her flower shall never wither. <clears throat> but shall become more and more beautiful, more and more fragrant, the more she perseveres in this venerable virtue. <laughs> so it is a beautiful thing to see a young man in the strength of his virtue. When he snips the flower of his own youth, and hands it to God and our Blessed Lady. It is an act of deep faith in God. 
of hope in the life of the world to come and of generous love for the crucified Savior. One of the proofs of the Church's divine character is that her sons and her daughters, in the prime of their youth, are moved by divine faith, divine hope, and divine charity to give up their lives in such a way and to place their virtue of chastity every day, as Pope Pius XII said, on the altar as a daily holocaust, a daily sacrifice to God. Just as the Church, by the grace of God, has her martyrs, that supreme act of faith in the next world, that supreme act of faith that our adherence to supernatural truth is more important than our possession of our natural lives, that great, deep act of faith which makes the saint. So also, young men and young women give themselves in a very similar act of faith and sacrifice by consecrating themselves to perfect chastity and continence. Another reason why this virtue is so beautiful is that it requires intense interior strength in order to practice it. There are, first of all, the unbridled interior passions that are present in everyone, which seek satisfaction. To overcome these passions is extremely difficult at times. And when men and women devote their lives to a daily abstinence from these pleasures, it is correctly perceived as a superhuman task. Just as crowds marvel at the Olympic star, so they marvel at those who faithfully accomplish their life of chastity. But beyond passion, which we share with the animals, there is in man what we call emotion. Emotion is associated with animal passion, but it is at the same time tied to our rational nature. So anger is an emotion, sadness is an emotion, despair is an emotion. As we all know, our emotions can deeply influence our lives. They form, in many ways, our personalities. And although they are meant to be subservient to reason and to enhance reason, they often do the reverse and dictate to reason. And that's when the trouble begins. Love is also an emotion. Indeed, it is the most basic of all of the emotions. There is in every human creature a desire, an emotion to love and to be loved. There is a strong emotional desire to love another person and to have that love accepted. What causes more sadness in a young man or a young woman when their love is unrequited? When there is no return of a love that is shown to another? And what is more troubling to a person than to have his marriage break up when the very person who is bound by contract 
to love turns on him or her and now hates. But the, the depths of sadness that that call causes, and it is due to the, the, the fact that we have this strong emotion in us to love and to have our love accepted. In turn, we have a strong emotional desire to be loved by someone else. Children languish if they're not loved by their parents. And even if you shower them with all sorts of money and gifts, if they perceive that you do not love them, they will grow up warped because they live on that love This emotional desire that I have just explained culminates in the love which spouses have for each other. And it is expressed in marriage. That's why people get married. Chastity as well offers this legitimate and warm emotion in sacrifice to God. It takes not only the sexual pleasures, but it takes this emotion which is actually stronger. This desire of love, to be loved, to give our love. It takes all of that which is actually stronger than the animal passions. And it places it on the altar of God. That is a very, very great sacrifice. Instead of offering their emotion of their love to another human being, <clears throat> they offer their love to God, like St. Joseph. Instead of seeking to be known and loved and cherished and understood by another human being, they seek to be known, loved, cherished, and understood by Almighty God. And they enter into a life of prayer and meditation and daily sacrifice in order to be one with God. For this is how it will be in heaven. God has made this desire of love in us this tremendous force of love in a human being for himself, for all of our loves in this life must be ordered to Almighty God ultimately. And we can never love anything outside of his law, no matter how good it is, no matter how much we are attached to it. We cannot love anything that is against his law. Everything that God made is for himself. And this strong emotion in us is ultimately for himself. That will give us the beatific vision. That will give us the joy of seeing God forever in heaven. And so priests and religious are beginning their heaven here by discovering that secret by the grace of God. Marriage is but a poor and dark image of the union of the soul with God in heaven. But St. Joseph is not, the, not only the model of priests, religious brothers, and nuns. For there is a chastity that pertains to every state in life, be it the single state, the married state, the religious state, or the priesthood. That married people have their chastity. They must obey the rules of the married state. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not even desire it because of the chastity of your state.
Nor is it necessary to remind ourselves of the power of the passion toward impurity. It is not uncommon that this despicable vice which lowers man to the level of an animal is the single factor that keeps a person in the state of mortal sin. It is not uncommon to find Catholics who are charitable, just, faithful in their obligations, at Mass every Sunday, pleasant and cheerful in character, faithful to their duties of state and life, who don't get drunk, who don't steal, who don't lie or cheat, who don't blaspheme or curse or backbite or calumniate, but who nevertheless live in the perpetual or nearly perpetual state of mortal sin owing to an insurmountable habit of impurity. Their one sin, so to speak, is impurity. But they commit this sin with such vigor and devotion, with such addiction, that they live their entire lives in a state of mortal sin. They persevere in these addictions into old age, and unless God grant them the extraordinary grace of contrition, they fail to have true contrition for their lifetime of sin, and they go straight to hell. They trade heaven for access to a single weakness, that of satisfying desire, the desire for flesh, flesh, that comes, as Genesis tells us, from the slime of the earth, and which will one day return to the slime of the earth, as we hear on every Ash Wednesday. Heaven is traded for the slime of the earth. And this life of complacent sin they pursue despite warning after warning, despite attempt after attempt, despite prayer after prayer, despite mortification after mortification like dogs returning to their vomit, as our Lord said himself, they return to their impurities. They love their sins, and they die in them. But some of them, by the grace of God, do manage to escape, and it is the duty of Holy Mother Church, in the person of her priests, constantly to exhort, to admonish, to threaten with God's punishment, to urge by presenting the example of the saints. And so today I present the example of Saint Joseph. Saint Joseph did not maintain his chastity as if he were some sort of emotionless automaton from outer space but maintained it in the same way that we do, although to an eminent degree. He maintained it by constant vigilance and prayer. Vigilance means to avoid all of the occasions of impurity, particularly television, internet, movies, magazines, books, <coughs> and photographs, as well as immodestly dressed people on the street and elsewhere. We should flee these things in the same way that we would flee a rabid dog, which was pursuing us in order to bite us. We must avoid undue freedom with our looks, our conversations, and our touches. 
We must watch over our thoughts, our desires, and our affections. And if we are courting, we must familiarize ourselves with the Catholic rules of courtship, which can be summarized in a single principle, which is that you must treat each other as brother and sister for the entire courtship until the day you're married. Brother and sister. Whatever is not considered correct between brother and sister is not correct for you. Prayer means to maintain a daily and fervent prayer life. Some prayer every day is better than a lot of prayer episodically. Prayer increases our love of God, and it is love of God, and it alone which will triumph over the nearly omnipotent passions of impurity. Meditation is especially recommended. In sacred scripture, it says, in all thy works, remember the last end, and thou shalt never sin. I'll give you an example from daily life. You're all using today what we call a GPS. That instrument has its mind, so to speak, constantly on the end. And if you make a wrong turn, it will immediately alert you to the fact that you have made a wrong turn. Because its mind, if we can use that term, is always on the end. And the more your mind is on the end, the less you will deviate from it. It would be impossible, therefore, to meditate on death, judgment, heaven, and hell, and still desire to commit sin. It would be impossible to look upon, in meditative prayer, the crucified Savior, his bleeding body, and say, I want to drive the nails into his hands, or I want to scourge him, you would be a monster to think such a thing. Yet this is what you are doing when you commit a sin of impurity. It is only when we lose sight of these realities, by failure to pray, that we ourselves become the prey of the devil through impurity. Pope St. Pius X gave us this beautiful indulgence prayer to St. Joseph, the model of chastity. O Joseph, virgin father of, of Jesus, most pure spouse of the Virgin Mary, pray for us daily to the same Jesus, the Son of God, that armed with the weapons of his grace, we may fight as we ought during life and be crowned by him at the moment of our death. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.